Hello, and welcome to today's 13th webinar in the Making Sense webinar series, Seven Keys to Servicing CO2 Systems, brought to you by Emerson Climate Technologies. I'm Robin Miller, and I'm your moderator today. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please note that this presentation's audio is not provided by phone number, but only through your computer sound system, so be sure to turn up your computer's volume. You may ask an online question at any time throughout today's presentation by clicking on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen. Simply type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default set as all panelists. Now, on to the presentation, seven keys to servicing CO2 systems. Discussing today's topic will be Andre Patinode. Director of CO2 Business Development with Emerson Climate Technologies. The webinar will begin now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks everyone for joining online today. Really appreciate it. Um, just want to, before I get started, just talk about, you know, CO2 booster systems uh, for a service mechanics perspective. I mean, we're going to be talking for about 45 minutes today. Uh, so really, there's no way to cover everything we need to cover in today's presentation. So I'm going to try to cover as many of the details as possible. But just keep in mind that there's a lot of other CO2 trainings that are out there that are put on by rack manufacturers out there that are will go out and service, train, so make sure that service technicians are, are properly informed when working on their system. So there's rack manufacturers also have training. And component manufacturers like Emerson also have CO2 training. So look out for those as you uh, want to pursue your, your education on CO2. Um, one of the other things I want to talk about is I want to thank uh, Jason Barton, who is the Vice President of Northwest Refrigeration, who helped me put this presentation together several months ago. And uh, Jason is actually runs a service division in Edmonton, Alberta. So a lot of the material was taken from his perspective when he wants to train a new service tech before he sends them into his supermarket, some of the main things that he needs to make sure that his service techs knows, I'm gonna to cover today. So that's really been the basis of today's presentation. Um, so what we'll cover today, three basics of system architecture and transcritical versus subcritical operation. Now. For those of you who already know about CO2, this will be a review. For those of you who's the first time attending a CO2 seminar, it's going to help to put your frame of mind for the rest of the presentation. So we'll cover those two things, and then we'll get into, from a service perspective, the three main differences between HSC and a CO2 system. We'll talk about low critical points, high triple point high pressures, two of those three things you, never, you may have never considered before when working on an HFC system. Then we'll talk about dealing with standstill pressures. What does that mean by managing pressures? What does that mean? Why do we have to worry about power outages where in the past we didn't have to worry about it so much? And then we'll talk a little bit about system peculiarities. What's different about CO2 versus working on an HFC system? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So, system architectures, typically on CO2, there's three main ones. The one on the top left side I'm gonna start with is a typical secondary system. The one on the, the, the top left, you've got a glycol where you've got a HFC primary on the top, so where you've got the red lines is your 134A system, typically, cooling a heat exchanger, which cools down glycol and gets circulated through your medium temp loads and on back. So you've got sensible heater removal there. On the right, in that top left bucket, if you will, you've got a primary uh, system. Again, it could be a 134A. In this case, we're showing scrolls doing the work. Chilling a plate heat exchanger who's cooling CO2, and that CO2 is being pumped out into the cases and it's removing heat in those cases latently. So you may get a 50-50% mix back of boiling refrigerant back. The pump power is significantly less than the glycol side. So there's a lot of systems that are like that uh, out there. And growing in popularity on secondary would be on the industrial refrigeration where the low temp CO2 and the primary even is uh, ammonia. That's growing in popularity. 
Uh, the bottom square, if you will, is a typical hybrid system. Again, the top section is a primary HFC. Again, could be 134A, very popular in many parts of the world. And so you've got 134A cooling your medium temp loads. You have 134A cooling a plate heat exchanger uh, where you see that yellow line, which is your CO2 circuit, 744, condenses your 744, sends it out to the cases. And through an electronic expansion valve, you've got DX cooling. Suction gas comes back to, and what we're showing here are scroll compressors, ZO scroll compressors, and that whole compression process starts again. And this system architecture is typically used in warmer climates. Um, now you move up to the top right corner, is really a lot of what we're gonna be focusing on today is transcritical booster systems. So I'm gonna just blow that up just a little bit larger so you can have a look at it. And I just wanna explain just by looking at this schematic right now, one thing that's obvious is that the low temp and the medium temps are interconnected. Now on an HFC system, you'll have a low temp rack on one side of the machine room, you'll have a medium temp rack on the other side. Well, this one, they're interconnected. You're using the same refrigerant, you're sharing the same refrigerant from the medium temp to the low temp. So we can see our medium temp compressors, those three semi-hermetics discharging out onto the roof in a gas cooler and or condenser, depends on the ambient, comes out still through that red line to a valve on the top left called a high pressure valve, high pressure reducing valve. So it literally drops the pressure down to a usable form and liquid falls out of that CO2 into a flash tank. Well, it looks a lot like a receiver because that's what it really is. It, it, it holds the liquid refrigerant in there and you can see the liquid now feeds all your medium temp loads and that same liquid line, that same liquid receiver also feeds all your low temp loads. Your low temp loads are your green line going to your low temp compressor, discharging into the medium temp compressors. You also have another source of suction gas. The medium temp loads, the light blue line from the middle there, is discharging into, is, is moving to a suction of your medium temp. Then you have this other valve tied to the top of the receiver Again, a third source of gas going into your medium temp compressor. So when you just look at the system, it does look differently than a standard HFC system and it shares the same refrigerant, which is important to note. So your medium temp compressors must operate before your low temp can actually perform. So that's just kind of a quick snapshot of a booster transcritical system, simple system. Another question that we get asked a lot is, what's the difference between transcritical and subcritical? Well, that system you just saw, if it's operating in Canada, will probably be operating in that subcritical zone all the time. So you can see that lower box, if you will, on this pressure enthalpy diagram is below that star. That star represents the critical point of the refrigerant we'll talk about in a few minutes which is 87.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're in Canada or you're in Northern US or in Northern Europe, you're gonna be below that point most of the year. If you're in a warmer climate or in the middle of July, like we are today, doesn't matter where you are, if it's a hot day, your, your condenser sitting on the roof in those warm ambient conditions, your pressures will rise above that 87.8 and that's in the supercritical zone, also called transcritical operation. So you could have one system in the afternoon today, it might be operating in a transcritical mode, and in the evening as it gets colder, it's operating in a subcritical mode. It'll go up and down. The other thing too, that when you take a look at this chart, you say, well, traditionally with basic system architectures, your transcritical system I just described have been generally in the blue areas. So the top and the bottom of this world map, if you will, global distribution map, is where systems have been traditionally operating. Um, with manufacturers of racks, uh, component manufacturers coming up with new components, rack manufacturers, 
pushing uh, designs. We're trying to take those two blue lines and move them closer to the equator, trying to get more use out of transcritical systems in the greater part of the world, warmer parts of the world. And I'll talk about what, what's being used to try to accomplish that in a few minutes. I'll touch on that. Uh, really, a quick map of the world. CO2 is, is not going away. It's been around for many years in Northern Europe. These are just basic estimates of supermarket and sea stores around the world uh, taken from different sources. And if you take a look at the blue boxes as transcritical systems, the orange boxes are accumulative of uh, hybrid and secondary systems. And you can just take a look at the European Union and the Europe, how many transcritical systems are operating in there. In the northern part, you'll see more transcritical. In the southern part of Europe, you'll see more of the secondary and cascade. If you move to Canada, again, in colder climates, we've only started about four years ago, so we're slower to adopt relative to Europe, but the numbers are growing in transcritical. And the U.S., the same. A few years ago, there was only three systems. Now there's upwards to about 70. So uh, you can see that it, it is growing. Retailers in the U.S. are uh, trialing these systems and uh, learning more about them. And various parts of the world, even Brazil, uh, are going to be putting in three systems this year to understand the viability of those types of systems. So it kind of gives you a snapshot for what's happening around the world. We're going to have a polling question now. Just take a few minutes. Okay, we're going to move ahead there now, waiting for the results. Oh, here are the results. I'm sorry. I can see that 26% uh, of, of the audience is made up of engineers, and OEM uh, is close behind. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking the time to fill out that, that question. We appreciate that. Okay, so we'll start talking about the, the three main differences between HFC and, and CO2 systems. And, and here's, here's the section that I was talking about originally from a, from a contractor's perspective, from an owner's perspective. When he's training a new guy uh, to go work on a CO2 store, these are key ingredients that his guys need to know. Uh, the three main differences between HFCs and 744 that we'll take a look at. One is low critical pressure. Um, and low critical pressure is, is only 87.8 degrees. Now, if you convert that to Celsius, it's 31 degrees Celsius. Uh, so it's, it's relatively low from a refrigerant's point of view. And it's something that, as an industry, we never really talked about in the past when we're talking about HFCs. But now that we're dealing with CO2, we are talking about it because it's, you can actually be operating above that critical point. Uh, you can see from this pressure enthalpy diagram, it looks similar to what you're used to. You've got a saturated liquid line, a saturated vapor line, but when you get to the very top of that thumbprint, if you will, uh, you reach that critical point. And once you're above that critical point, your liquid and vapor densities become the same. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a second and show you a quick video of the uh, setup. This is a video, a YouTube video that I found very useful, that it shows uh, CO2 within a enclosed container. You can see in the back 28.2 degrees Celsius uh, is the start line. You've got CO2 liquid on the bottom, and you've got vapor on the top. You'll see what happens when this container gets heated and the refrigerant starts to boil. The CO2 starts to boil. You've got, you can see it happen right now. You've lost some of that liquid refrigerant into a vapor. You're 27 degrees. As the liquid temperature rises, the CO2 evaporates into the fluid level below. And you'll see it as the temperature in the back continues to rise, the liquid drops very quickly. And what's interesting at this point of 31 degrees Celsius, the transcritical point, the density now of the liquid and vapor have become one. And that's a unique feature. That's what happens when you're above that critical point. And you can actually change the pressure without affecting the temperature or change the temperature without affecting the pressure. So those are also unique when, when dealing with CO2. And you can see here from 33 degrees, he's cooling down the container and that vapor now has just hit that saturated a uh, liquid line and your liquid starts to form, your vapor turns into a liquid and that process repeats itself. So you can get that on the video. If you download the presentation, you will see the link at the bottom of page 13. Bottom of page 13, you'll see that link and you can view it at your own speed. The other thing that's important for service techs to actually understand is triple point. A triple point is a point where your, your, your three phases of CO2 coexist at one point, and that minus 69.8 degrees seems kind of low, but the pressure is 60.4 pounds. That's not low as far as refrigeration is concerned. So you need to understand that you can never be close to that point, uh, or you can have some CO2 turn to dry ice on you. Here's a picture on the right of a filter dryer shell where a technician thought that he had the pressure. He had all the liquid out of his system. And as soon as he cracked the bolts and the system was exposed to ambient uh, pressure, atmospheric pressure, which is 14.5, 14.7 pounds, boom, that liquid turned to dry ice immediately. Uh, so now you've got to wait until that dry ice sublimes. It'll just evaporate. Um, but one thing that's unique is that, that dry ice, when it freezes like that, it doesn't expand like your ice cube tray at home, for example, that starts to overflow if you put too much water in it. It stays in that size, so you have to wait until it sublimes off, clean all your surfaces dry, and start up your system. So also an important note, when you're charging a system, you can't just very well start charging with liquid because the internal pressures of your system before you start will be well below your 64, 61 pounds. So you have to vapor charge the system to about 145 pounds seems to be a generally accepted pressure. Wait till the system, all sections of the system have equalized to 145 pounds of vapor. And then you can grab a liquid bottle and charge with liquid. That way you're assured that you won't have any um, dry ice forming in your charging lines or anywhere in the system. High pressure, the other thing, people get a little freaked out about CO2 and high pressures. So one thing from a service tech's point of view to understand is that high pressures, when we're talking about CO2, is the red section you see on my system chart on the right, which correlates to the pressure enthalpy chart there, the red lines. I mentioned earlier that point one is suction of my medium temp compressors. Well, as it compresses on a hot day and you're in a supercritical zone and transcritical mode, 
you could be at 1,300 or 1,400 pounds in 240 degrees. But that goes up onto the roof, goes into the gas cooler, and then comes out of the gas cooler back into the machine room. All of that associated piping today is made of stainless steel. Now in the future, there'll be some high pressure copper that will be available up to 120 bar rating. But for the most part today in North America, it's made of stainless steel. Going out onto the roof and back to that valve at point three and four, that's your pressure reducing valve. Three reduces it from the 1,300 pounds down to about four, 500 pounds. So now the rest of your system from four, everything in the middle, intermediate and suction gas is almost the same pressures that you're used to working on 410A high side systems. It's in that four, 500 pound range. The only real high pressures would be hot summer and it's mostly contained to the roofs. So it's important to know where those pressures are. Um, from a transcritical operation, we, we talked about a, a little earlier on, um, a transcritical system in a colder environment is more efficient. And if you take the system on the right, this is weather data taken out of the Copeland product selection software, which takes 8,760 hours of operation over a year in Toronto weather data and says, you know what? Um, from 80 ambient and above in Toronto, for example, or Northern US, your system will operate roughly around 200 hours in transcritical operation. In Atlanta, Georgia, based on our weather data information, it could conceivably operate 1,000 hours in transcritical mode. But manufacturers have come up with ways to try to reduce that 1,000 hours to you know, less than 100. In this case, we're saying if you had an adiabatic gas cooler or some type of spray system, you could possibly keep those transcritical operating hours much lower. In, in this case, we calculated around nine hours a year. So there are ways to reducing, uh, improving efficiencies on transcritical systems. And, and this slide basically just quickly talks about five ways uh, that OEMs and component suppliers have been working on for several years. Uh, the one, the first one, spray nozzles is the top right image, basically a condenser that mists water as the ambient gets warm so that you get cool uh, air coming across the coil, keeping the condensing temperatures lower. The same effect you'll get out of the second point, the adiabatic gas cooler, which is the middle top image where you've got these adiabatic pads along the outside of the condensers. You trickle water down along those pads. As the air gets pulled across, the moist air, not free water, but the moist air gets drawn across those aluminum fins, keeps it cooler, keeps it uh, from going into transcritical for as long as possible. Uh, another technology is parallel compression, sometimes called, some people are called like flash tank compression. What, whatever you want to call it, it's the image, the bottom middle image that shows that yellow line from the top of my flash tank going directly to an independent compressor. And that's another means of reducing energy under high ambient because you're working at a higher suction pressure on that one compressor, you can downsize the motor, save efficiency. Another one is subcooling, bottom right hand image. If you, even though you're outside and it's warm, if you, you can continue to cool that gas on a pressure enthalpy diagram, it's obvious to see the more you cool that gas, you move to the left of the chart, which you're increasing your BTUs per pound. So you're increasing your efficiency. And the last one that's also being tried is, uh, is ejectors. It's basically a means of using the energy, the high pressure gas energy, and converting it to useful work in the system. It allows your system to operate, uh, your evaporators to operate with very low superheat, which in turn allows for a rise in suction temperature, which adds efficiency to a system. So those are five ways that the industry has been using to improve efficiencies of transcritical systems. 
We're going to take a minute now, if you can please answer uh, the second question, polling question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for filling it out. It appears that uh, most of you on the line have not worked on the system, but the ones that have have worked on some secondary systems, uh, which does make a lot of sense because the majority of systems that are out there currently in the U.S. and, and in Canada, um, I know there may be other areas dialing in, uh, but the majority of those systems today are, are secondary. So thank you very much for that. One of the things as well from, again, if I go back from the from an owner of a contracting firm's perspective, you know, what's important to him is for his guys and his organization to understand how do we manage power outages. They're a fact of life. They're going to happen. In some areas, they happen more often than others. Um, and so let's take a look at a few things. One, one of the things that many supermarkets have done is they use generators and standby condensing units um, in order to mitigate the risk when there's power outage. And in CO2, when a system shuts down for a longer period of time, pressures will build quicker than they do on an HFC system. So if we don't want to lose some of that CO2 through our pressure relief valves, uh, they'll install a little standby condensing unit that when the power outage goes off, Generator kicks on, powers the condensing unit, which has a loop inside the receiver or flash tank. It cools the volume of liquid within that tank, keeps the pressure down so that your pressure relief don't go. So that's one way of doing it. On some smaller systems, uh, maybe there is a, uh, we call it a, uh, a fade-out vessel, which is just a large vessel that could accommodate uh, refrigerant to keep the pressures low, uh, increasing volume in the system when the system's down. Um, another thing too that's important is you need a refrigerant plan. When you're talking to a customer about CO2, when you're going into a store, there's certain things that you really need to understand. A uh, local codes, I mean, where can you store the CO2 cylinders? Are you allowed to store them outside the building? Do they have to be inside the building? Um, does the end user want them on the mezzanine? This contractor had a real issue because there was about 2,000 pounds of gas in this store. And first the store said, well, you know what, we'll put them in the mezzanine. Well, each one of the CO2 bottle has about 50 pounds of gas in it, but the bottle weighs 200 pounds. And at 2,000 pounds of gas, that's 40 bottles or 8,000 pounds of cylinders in refrigerant. And if you're storing an entire system charge, you gotta get those bottles typically up the stairs of a mezzanine, 240 of those 200 pound bottles, and then lay them on a floor where the mezzanine may not be able to handle 8,000 pounds in a concentrated area. So those are little things that you need to be able to understand and work out before the store opens. Where to store them, uh, getting them in the machine room, all that type of thing. The, the other thing as well is if you've got 40 tanks to fill a system in, God forbid you, you've got to cut it, something happens and you lose the entire system charge and you've got to replace it all at once, 40 bottles. So, so what this contractor has done, he's, he developed himself a charging manifold. He had a high-pressure certified welder, uh, put it together, got the high-pressure uh, hoses, so you can manifold up to six cylinders at once, pipe them to a line, 
because these were not stored in the machine room and then send the refrigerant up into the mezzanine and onto into the rack. So that was one uh, method from one contractor. The, the other thing to understand as well, when there's a power outage, if you have stepper motor electronic valves on every case rather than a pulse width modulated type of solenoid closing valve, if it's a stepper valve, and you have a power outage, well, that valve stays in the position it was at when the power was, was lost. And what can happen is you can have a lot of your evaporators flood with refrigerant. Those cold CO2 evaporators, CO2 loves the cold, it'll migrate there quickly. And when you start up the system, it comes back to the compressors. And these are just a few pictures um, of some of the damage that can do. As a matter of fact, I was looking at a, at a warranty return compressor, CO2 compressor this morning that was liquid slug so severely that every one of those scroll flanks were torn right off its base. That's how much power there is in a three-phase motor when it's filled with liquid refrigerant. It'll just tear them apart. So you have to find, you know, one of the things that this contractor did before their store actually opened up, they actually did some some trial power outages so their mechanics can practice and understand the different issues that occur before the store actually opens and have to deal with a real situation. So those are just some of the things that have been done in the past. Uh, from a service tech's perspective, finding a leak can be challenging. I mean, before the store open is one thing, but after the store is open, if it's not an obvious leak in the machine room, it can be very difficult to find a leak out in the case. I mean, we're dealing with CO2. There's 400 parts per million of CO2 in the air we breathe, and then you're standing around with a leak detector trying to sniff CO2. And it, you could be in there late at night, and there's a floor buffer, with chemicals and putting off chemicals and throwing off your leak detector. So it can be a, it can be a tricky um, a thing to find a leak. Dedicated set of gauges in high pressure hoses. This was interesting because Jason was telling me that his guys prefer to work on a CO2 system than an old HFC system. And I said, well, why is that? They said, well, rack manufacturers today with CO2 have pressure transducers everywhere. They have temperature sensors everywhere. So these guys walk into a machine room. If they want to know the pressure of this or the temperature of that, they can just call it up on their, on their, uh, their controller. They have that available to them, so it's easier to find pressures and temperatures. And they also left a gauge set, a good, new, calibrated gauge set with the proper high pressure hoses in the machine room so the guys don't have to drag their tools or their gauges in there. So it, it ends up being actually easier to work on uh, if you take the, pro the proper measures. Preventative maintenance, however, is, you know, it's important on the CO2 systems. You want to make sure that all your, your, your T's are crossed and your, your I's are dotted and uh, that there is a maintenance plan because End users want to make sure that when they install a, a CO2 system that their total cost of ownership is not going up, it's going down. And like anything, like any system, a preventive maintenance schedule and a proper plan will help ensure that. Understand the consequences of trapping CO2. Again, you may say, well, geez, Andre, we need to understand that for 404A. We understand when you get liquid trapped between two valves, pressure rises. That's true. With CO2, it rises faster than HFC. So you do have to make sure that if someone's going in doing some service, adding valves here or there, that you're not trapping two valves that could potentially close with no escape route through a pressure relief or through a check valve to another area of the system. Very important to make that double check. Is there a relief somewhere in case something gets trapped? And also when you're, when, when you're you know, you could be fine, but all of a sudden someone comes in and reprograms a controller and accidentally closes two valves, and there's, which originally wasn't designed to do, and then you've got a potential for liquid trapping. So be aware of that. Um, there's many of you who are on the line today, so you, know, you understand the benefits of training. Training service personnel is absolutely critical uh, for CO2. And, and quite, quite frankly, a lot of end users 
um, are concerned about trading. They want their service guys to know more about CO2 and know more about refrigeration, uh, you know, in general. If a service contractor has a good refrigeration knowledge base, CO2 is not a stretch at all. It's just slightly different. So it's not a matter of, you know, if you've got a CO2 application, just pick up the phone book and call any refrigeration company. It's important that you call a refrigeration company that, A, has a training program. If they haven't done it yet, they will before they start training in your store, or they already have experience working in those stores. So that's important. A peculiarity of CO2, something that's a little odd, and again, in putting this presentation together, Jason talked about a particular situation that he was ripping out his hair uh, because it was frustrating. He had evaporators lined up like this, just like you see, electronic valves on all three evaporators. They're all going down to a common suction. And the one on the far left is working just fine. The one in the middle wasn't set up properly, and it was flooding back. The third evaporator on the far right, the loads were very low on this evaporator. And what happened, the flooding effect of the middle one started to influence the temperature sensor on the third one, saying, hey, it's cold. I'm flooding back. So it, the controller, electronic controller, case control would say, okay, valve number three on the right-hand side, I'm going to close you down because my pressure transducer and temperature sensor, I'm reading that I'm getting some flood back. So the valve closes, but what was happening is the temperature in the coil on the right was not going up. It was still maintaining temperature even though the valve was closed. So... They show up at the job and they go, well, I don't understand. It's at temperature. My controller is saying my valve's at 0% open. So the mechanic shuts down the system, takes the valve apart, looks at it, cleans it, said it wasn't dirty, it was fine. Starts it up again, oh, valve's working at the right percentage, it's working real good. About a week later, they check into it again. Geez, the valve's at 0% again, but the coil is okay. So what can be causing that? Well, we come to find out that the, the picture on the left that you're looking at, that's a run. So my arrow is going from the, the, the coil that was working, that was flooding, and you had free draining suction line into that last coil. That free draining suction line, that liquid CO2 would go into the line, affect the temperature sensor, Controller thinks it's flooding, closes down the valve, but CO2 is so efficient that it kept it boiling. So what they had to do is actually, the picture on the right, is repipe the suction so that it was not free draining to the, to the coil. And that completely eliminated the problem. So if it was flooding back, it would bypass, just go on its merry way, and not affect that last coil. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, some of these little things happen in the field. The, a couple other things, system cleanliness, there's a lot of joints, uh, racks could have stainless steel, so it's important, of course, when you're doing work to use nitrogen, purge nitrogen to make sure you, you reduce the oxidation inside, because if you've got too much oxidation, you can see the picture on the top right corner of an oil separator filter that just blew. It's not because of the quality of the filter at all. It has nothing to do with it. It's because it took in so much metal particulates and dirt that the pressure built up and, and caused it to, to go. The other thing down here is system cleanliness. Really important to note that CO2 liquid can hold about 20 times more moisture than CO2 in its vapor form, 20 times more moisture. So that means if you have wet CO2 traveling in your liquid line and then it reaches the expansion valve and the expansion valve drops the pressure, of course, and now you're into a vapor mode, that liquid, that water moisture can actually drop right out of that solution. And now you've got free water in your evaporators and that's not a good thing um, because moisture can actually cause a carbonic acid uh, and eat away at steel components in your system. So how do you guard against that? 
Well, you've got to make sure you've got a moisture indicator in your liquid line that's sensitive enough to be able to measure, like we can see here, very dry at 14 degree liquid or at 32 degree liquid, it's eight, 11 parts per million. That, that's pretty low. So you would know if you're dry enough. From a refrigerant point of view, uh, the recommended CO2 refrigerant to be used in the, in, in the refrigeration is grade four, uh, sometimes called Coleman grade. It's 99.99% pure. Uh, those containers are cleaned and evacuated before they're charged with CO2. And there's less than 10 parts per million. That's the, the spec is less than 10 parts per million of moisture within with that refrigerant. So that's important to note. Uh, the bottle on the right is a vapor bottle. There's no line on it. Uh, so your valve is on the top and you're just continuously pulling vapor. So that's what you use in order to get your system up to that 145 pound threshold in vapor before you switch tanks to the liquid fill, which would be much faster. And, uh, and that's just the two different kinds of tanks that, that are available. So from a uh, conclusion or takeaway point of view, CO2 pressures are higher than HFCs. We, we know that, but they are manageable. And like I said, you understand the basic refrigeration, your peculiarity of CO2, and you're careful with all your precautions like you were always taught, it's not gonna be an issue. Contractors must have a strategy with the power off condition. How do you deal with the, the, the schedule shutdown? How do you deal with unscheduled shutdown, like a power outage? And there's thunderstorms today here in Sydney, and I don't know if I'll finish the presentation, but we'll <laughs> see. Understanding peculiarities of uh, 744 will reduce the maintenance costs and downtime. So the more you know about it, the more effective you can be for your end user, your customer. Uh, system cleanliness we talked about. And properly trained service technicians is key. I mean, it's key for all of us to continue with education and, and it's a testament today of the amount of people that that uh, actually signed up and, and uh, are attending the seminar. So we really appreciate that. So that's all I have for a, uh, a formal presentation. So at this time, we'll take some questions. Okay, yep, now on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, click on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen and type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default set as all panelists. We did have a couple questions come in during the presentation, Andre. First will be, will dry ice turn back into a liquid or vapor if it is repressurized? Yes, it, I mean, as it, as it sublimes, it sublimes into a vapor. And, and you can get that back into a liquid when properly pressurized. Okay, great. Now I've got another, another question here. If you have the ability to capture it. <laughs> it sublimes into the atmosphere. Huh? You can't capture it. <laughs> okay. When there's a power outage, what components do you recommend being on emergency power? And what is the minimum suction side pressure relief valve setting you recommend for standstill redundancy of the system to keep CO2 from venting excessively? Well, different manufacturers have different ratings for pressure relief valves. I mean, um, typically uh, on the low side of the system, it's, it's somewhere around 450 pounds, but it depends. The pressure relief on any, on any part of the system is dependent on the weakest component within that section. So if your weakest component is, if you're using a part, for example, that has a, a, a maximum standstill pressure of 450 pounds for the low side, then your pressure relief must be just below that or around that point. If you can live with higher, if your components are rated to a higher rating, then your pressure release can be a little higher. So. Typically, they'll be around 450 pounds for a low temp CO2 application, but it could vary depending on the components used. Okay. Um, now, the, the other part of the question was about- Power uh, outage, and which components do you recommend being on emergency power? The many, many, from the supermarket point of view, many have um, 
standby auxiliary condensing units, and really that's what's on the auxiliary power. That's one way to do it. Um, so that power goes down, starts up the unit, the unit starts cooling the receiver, which keeps the refrigerant charge at a lower pressure. If, if you don't have that, uh, at our particular location, we have a, a hybrid system installed in Canada in our integrated learning center. And what we've done is if there's a power outage, we've got the backup generator to look after our E2 rack controller. Uh, there's a few transducers and a, a what we call a burp valve. It's a valve that is connected to a transducer and the controller knows that if my pressure reaches X amount, which is below my pressure relief, I'll burp a little bit outdoors, outside. And that allows the whole system pressures to drop and gives it time to build up pressure again. And we'll keep doing that to try to keep the system, the refrigerant in the system for as long as possible so that when power resumes, we haven't lost a significant amount of refrigerant. Great. So there's different strategies. Thank you. Are there any requirements for temperatures for storing CO2 cylinders? Uh, typically, CO2 cylinders are, are rated for, a, I believe it's 1,300 pounds. I would have to double check that. But um, if the cylinder, for example, is sitting at, at 20 degrees Celsius, I have that in my head, what's that, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, is 812 pounds. So they are rated to handle high pressures sitting standstill. So. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for like other miscellaneous parts that a company would want to have on hand at the site for maintenance? Well, that 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 is a good point, and one thing that I didn't really talk about is, um, well, CO two for example. You can't just go to a wholesaler and buy forty jugs of CO two. Wholesalers, uh, traditional refrigeration wholesalers, don't stock CO two, so you have to go to a gas supplier to get that. And gas suppliers typically have a lot of industrial grade CO2, but not grade four. So you have to be prepared to have, depending on the end user, if he wants to have an entire system charge in the facility, then that is advisable. That's one thing. Uh, there may be special valves that are critical to the operation of the system, because if the valves come from Europe, for example, or other parts of the world, or because the volume is not, it's, they're not valves that it will be sitting at every wholesale shelf yet because it's relatively new. They may want to make sure that they've got those critical components, one of them in the store as well, because if it's a critical component, you can't wait two, three weeks to get it. You have to have it. Uh, so, and, and so that's really what it is. And so you, you work with your, your OEM, your equipment manufacturer to establish what those critical components are and you make sure that you're protected by either you having them or them having them for you. Okay, great. I've got a three-part question, but it really flows well, so I'll remind you well, if you good. need anything. But what is the recommended pressure test for high side? What is the recommended pressure test for low side? And then finally, what is the recommended level of vacuum before charging? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll defer that to Casey. Casey, are you on the line? Thank you. Uh, hey, yes, I'm Andre. Can you handle? Can you uh, answer that question? So you've been involved with it till closer than I have. Uh, you know, on the vacuum, I mean, basically, you know, you should follow best uh, practices. Um, you know, as you would on an HFC system. So that's a 500 micron. Uh, break the vacuum three times. Uh, what was the uh, first part of that question? What is the recommended pressure test for high side and low side? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the recommended uh, pressure test. I will probably have to get back uh, to the person on that question if we can take their name down. Okay. Then should I move on for some additional questions? Ready? Okay. Um, will CO2 be used outside supermarkets, for example, for walk-ins and restaurants? Absolutely. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. Actually, they are already being used in, in Europe for those applications. Um, and, you know, one of the things that has limited 
uh, its use right now is really the scalability. Um, we need to have more products for those smaller equipment, number one, and, and the other one is, is economics. You know, when it makes sense that a CO2 transcritical or, or, or CO2 condensing unit becomes close to a, an HFC or another refrigerant, um, then there'll be more acceptance. But absolutely, not just, not just uh, condensing units, uh, heat pumps, they're extensively used in, in water, uh, domestic hot water use in, in Japan right now, and commercial hot water heating as well. So um, we're going to see that in the, the air conditioning heat pump space in the future as well. But right now, it's, it's supermarket has been dominating the, the space in uh, North, or really around the world initially. Is there any oil return consideration for CO2? No more different than uh, HFC systems. It uses PUE oil. It's a, it's a higher grade of PUE. It's a 68 or an 85, depending on the manufacturer's specification. But all the, the piping practices you follow with HFC systems, you follow with CO2 and oil return is, is pretty much the same. Thank you. Okay. In the event of a power off, why is it not standard practice to build in a contingency such as installing a vessel receiver within a low temperature cold room to allow the system charge to migrate to the vessel preventing venting of the total system charge? Well, that is an option, and that's, we've also done that in Canada. We use the fade-out vessel. I mean, you, if you're willing to invest in a vessel that, you know, when all the, it's basically extra space within, confined within that system, um, it, it's possible to do that. Again, it, it has to do with the investment cost to be able to do it. Um, but it, it will, as, it, as the, the system is off, the pressure just migrates to these larger vessels that keeps the pressures low even though it may be warm in the space, and you won't, you know, lose it through a pressure relief valve. Again, it, it's, it, it's fine. It's, it's economics. Okay. Um, I, have, I have another question here, and I think you kind of just answered that with what they're doing in Japan, but I think we'll ask it anyway. Um, what is the smallest 744 system? Uh, actually, Coke. The ballers, um, they have their Coke machines have 744, so very small charges. Uh, so there's small, you know, cans, compressor, we call them cans, small can compressors, if you will, uh, being used for that small of capacities. So your red, you know, your, your Coke, as a matter of fact, is, is, is decided to go CO2. Others have used propane with that size equipment, but Coke have decided to use CO2, for example. Okay. Um, and then here's another one from an earlier question, but just to clarify, if I open the dryer shell and see dry ice, can I close it back up and fill it with 150 PSI vapor and the dry ice will go away? Well, that's a good point. Uh, if you open the dryer shell, you see dry ice, it will immediately start to sublime. Um, and uh, if you were to close the shell and you slowly introduce CO2 vapor, well, you, the thing is, you want you want to evacuate before you charge, so you'll be introducing moisture into the system if if you let that happen. But technically, if you add vapor to an area where there's dry ice, slowly, not quickly, very slowly, it'll help speed up the sublimation to occur. The recommendation here would be. Don't touch the ice with your hands because it's minus 109.3 surface temperature. It looks innocent enough. And if you're having a party and you want to put dry ice in your martinis, just make sure you've got proper protective <laughs> gear because uh, it's minus 109.3 degrees. So you need the proper protective gear, get rid of that dry ice. And now because it's been so cold, you've got moisture that's humidity now within the space, so you've got to clean that free water away because you don't want that free water inside your refrigeration system because of the potential for carbonic acid and other issues that can happen when you have moisture in the system. Okay, I think I have time for one more question, maybe. Um, should the CO2 systems operate with a full column of liquid feeding the expansion valve? Uh, typically that they do, yes, because uh, it's like it's like any 
it's like any expansion device. You size you size the valve for uh, vapor-free liquid, and um, many of the CO2 systems are operating with with liquid temperature somewhere in the 30 to 40 degree range. So again, something that's a little different about CO2 is those liquid lines will be insulated, uh, whereas your typical liquid lines wouldn't because your temperatures would be so much higher. Okay. That's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you all for your participation. Within approximately 24 hours after this live event, you can access this presentation on demand at emersonclimate.com backslash making sense webinars. Emerson Climate Technologies is hosting a response webinar to the EPA's SNAP ruling on Tuesday, August 18th, presented by Rajan Rajendran. Mark your calendars to attend the webinar and learn more about this industry-changing ruling. On behalf of Emerson Climate Technologies, thank you for attending today's Making Sense webinar. Information and registration will be available soon for our next webinar. We hope you can join us again. Thank you. Thank you.